Also, hello to Crocker, Jane, Terry, Andre, Kim, Super, great to see you. Lawrence, great to see you. Emil, Pandora's Box, hello, hello. Okay, so we are going to, oh, before I do anything, hello, uh, Chad as well. Everyone else out there zoning. Wow, long time no see, man. Hope you're doing well out there. And so, uh, before we get started, this channel is for educational purposes only, or perhaps entertainment purposes only, whichever the law may prefer. Everyone needs to do their own research, come up with their own conclusions. Okay, so, got, uh, okay. <laughs> So what we're going to be doing is heading into a new series, okay? And it's going to be on Michael Newton's book, Memories of the Afterlife. We'll do a cover-to-cover -cover commentary. Some of you may have already seen I've gone over his other two books, Journey of Souls and Destiny of Souls. Feel free to check those out. There are playlists available on all the platforms. And, um, so, all right, kind of before we get into this, it's, I just want to kind of give an introduction because a lot of times when I've done these types of videos, I get, um, a whole different crowd seeking the books and they don't really, well, sometimes they appreciate it. Sometimes they, they're expecting the book and maybe run into the soul trap by accident, but I just wanted to kind of go over the reasoning for the soul trap in a very, very brief, just a few minutes here. So um, it's for anyone new who are otherwise on the fence and questioning this reality that we all find ourselves in. We come here lifetime after lifetime, not knowing where we came from, why we are here, where we are going. We are also... Um, memory wiped as a result of that. And what happens is, is we keep reincarnating over and over again, or at least staying within the overall matrix system and not allowing ourselves to think bigger about what could be outside, not just Earth, but the overall system, including the astral realms, whatever the case may be, right? So my push on this channel is to just say, hey, let's just start thinking a little bigger and not confine ourselves to limited thinking like that the astral is what it claims to be, that what it's selling is the truth. Because let's just be honest, right? I mean, we all are here and we came from there, at least while in this system. So that should kind of be a red flag when you see the levels of atrocities going on in this realm and then on the flip side, you have uh, a whole host of experiencer types saying that, oh, well, you know, you're here to learn and grow and everything's about love. Well, there's a disconnect there. There's a big disconnect. So for me, that uh, caused me to investigate this realm a little bit more. And looking at experiencer cases is definitely part of that and past life regressions life between lives that's all part of it and michael newton's research is pretty epic um you know obviously uh he's providing data for us but i but his overall conclusion that you know there's a reason for all this and it's just and all that that that's where uh, the disconnect comes in and where questioning this reality should be even, you know, further scrutinized because when you have one narrative telling you it's all about love and growth and, and all this other stuff, and then everything is counterintuitive to it and you can't learn or grow off of an experience coming back here if you have no recall of what to work on. So that could be things like karma. Um, so there's a, there's a lot, a lot of issues with all experiencer types and what they're selling. And it's not that I don't believe them because I certainly believe experiencers. 
and the data is very, very consistent, which is the beauty of our modern world that we have access to that type of information. But what it also does is opens up a can of worms to really, really scrutinize this reality and where we're, where we came from, at least in terms of the matrix. Now we are eternal creator beings and I think it's only smart for us to, again, think bigger. Think bigger. If we're eternal beings, and we are, then where were we before we even came into the whole matrix system? That, again, that's astral realm. That's any realms related to this place, including Earth. The whole umbrella. That's why it's kind of just best to call it a matrix because it's there's tons of different realms related to this. And... We don't know how many physical realms there are. We know there's a lot of astral realms. But thinking bigger is saying, hey, okay, I'm, I'm eternal being. I know I existed outside of this. So what was I doing? Where was I going? Who was I relating with? I mean, there's got to be other beings besides what we're going to talk about in this series, which are soul groups, right? There's got to be other beings. We've traversed various realms and matrices throughout the, let's just say, multiverse. Okay? So that's all I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to say, hey, sit back, give this a listen, and, and, and think about how it's contradictory to what's happening here. And ask yourself, too, like, why should I have to work on this and this and that and this and that, you know? when I'm being memory wiped every time I come down here, you know? And there's like a, a false hierarchical system. We get addicted to this sensory experience. We also get addicted to various different attachments, friends, family, pets, material things, and everything in between. Uh, soul groups in general, um, teachers, guides, council of elders, and on and on and on. Like we have this kind of like zoned in approach to a limited existence when we are much bigger than that and deserve much better. So that's kind of my intro to the series. It's going to be a long one, my friends. We're going to be doing some weekday streams in the coming uh, weeks ahead. Uh, our second one will likely be on Tuesday and I should have a schedule out by, by Wednesday. So, uh, keep an eye on things, keep an eye on the community tab, uh, and the social media accounts. Cause I'll be making those announcements there. If you want to get, uh, notified for the series. So, all right. So here we're going with part one. The first maybe half hour is kind of a general breakdown of Newton, Newton's uh, research is very, very, you know, a lot of you will be familiar with it. And then the experiencers accounts, the cases that we'll be going over will be in the probably about like maybe like half hour, 45 minutes from now. So it's a, it's a little bit of a kind of primer in the beginning. All right. So here we go. And uh, welcome again. Good to see you. Let's get rolling. Memories of the afterlife, life between lives, stories of personal transformation. Edited by Michael Newton, Ph.D., with case studies by members of the Newton Institute. Narrated by Peter Burkrot and Exe Sands. Copyright 2009 by Michael Newton with Llewellyn Worldwide Limited, And was produced... I hold that when a person dies, his soul returns again to earth. Arrayed in some new flesh disguise, another mother gives him birth. With sturdier limbs and brighter brain, the old soul takes the roads again. John Macefield Introduction Early in the 4th century A.D., the Greek philosopher Iamblichus wrote, A man who can unlock his soul is set free. As a result of the forces of reincarnation, we are all products of our past physical lives on earth, as well as our spiritual soul experiences between lives. The soul of every person on this planet 
retains all former karmic influences of cause and effect from many sources, and these forces impact our current feelings and behavior. Thus, while people may appear to be functioning normally on the outside, we can have deep-seated metaphysical provocations of distress that are masked from traditional medical doctors, mental health professionals, and even from ourselves. There are difficult episodes in our current lives when we don't comprehend what is driving us in ways that seem irrational. The underlying reasons for these strange sensations are typically obscure, lying far below the surface of our consciousness. Most people will do anything to expose their internal demons, but where should they look? This book is about the self-discovery of hidden knowledge contained within the unconscious mind and what unlocking this sacred information through hypnosis has meant for people therapeutically. From the hypnosis subjects whose cases are detailed here, we will see how revelations from past incarnations and the afterlife have positively affected their conscious minds, providing keys of understanding to a variety of psychological problems. These recovered spiritual memories have brought greater meaning and empowerment into their lives. This book is meant to inspire and bring new hope to people everywhere who wish to see design and order in their existence. Okay, so just um, kind of starting off here, because I do have to kind of, even though I'd like to just let this go, I kind of have to say a few things every once in a while for certain reasons. Um, you know, the, the beauty of hypnosis is that you can really help yourself uh, and actually alleviate some suffering, traumas, fears that you have that may have been occurred or most likely have occurred in a past lifetime which carries over, which is a big issue in and of itself. These types of traumas, it's interesting, right? How they carry over subconsciously, which in a realm like this that is predicated on suffering, it's, it's amazing that that's happening. Anyways... Let's continue. We'll, we'll get into more of that as we move along. Memories of the afterlife involve clients who came to a specialized group of Life Between Lives, LBL, hypnotherapists, for spiritual regression. Quite often, the typical client schedules an appointment simply to explore matters relating to their sole purpose in life. However, the stories in this book involve more disturbing core conflicts requiring specific resolution. The authors of these poignant stories have employed a unique hypnotherapy process with their hypnosis subjects that involves a deep trance state generally lasting from three to four hours. The scope of this book is distinctive in the approach that has been taken to document the follow-up studies devoted to the life-transforming benefits of LBL hypnotherapy. It should also be mentioned that the stories in this book are just a small sample from the large number of cases reported and reviewed online each year by the Newton Institute's general membership. Each of our authors has presented an actual client case history. Pseudonyms are used to preserve client anonymity, with the client's permission. These stories begin by presenting the client's stated problem and how that issue was uncovered and then resolved through spiritual regression. They end with post-session communications with the client about the benefits of their LBL experience. The guidance by LBL facilitators in these individual cases is extremely comprehensive, although condensed here by our requirements of limited story length. Therapeutic inquiry is conducted with a view to the history of relevant incarnations by the soul, and particularly the soul's existence between lives in the spirit world. It is here where karmic lessons are formulated for the next life. Thus, current problems the client may be having on earth are analyzed within the perspective of both a physical, human, and spiritual soul element. For effective progression into the spirit world, it is of prime importance that potential clients find a highly trained LBL hypnotherapist to work with them. While there are a multitude of reasons where facilitator experience with the spirit realm will prove invaluable to the client, I would like to cite one area of concern as an example. On very rare occasions, a client could report a spirit world visualization 
that might initially seem threatening to them. Typically, such a disturbing report will mean one of two things to the skilled and properly trained LBL facilitator. Conscious interference caused by preconditioning, such as a religious belief in hell and evil spirits that do not actually exist in the afterlife, is one aspect. This involves earthly superstitions. All of our research with thousands of cases clearly shows the afterlife to be a realm of love, compassion, forgiveness, and justice. A more customary and subtle challenge are visualizations that symbolize karmic forms of cosmic accountancy, significant to the client's soul self. Here, the experienced, well-trained practitioner will recognize metaphoric scenarios that might well be designed as teaching lessons, often by the subject's spirit guide and master teachers on the spiritual plane. The client, however, may become confused and not be able to interpret such teaching manifestations for what they actually are at first. Conscious interference here by the subject could be attempts to cope with new revelations that they have not yet processed in the session. While the LBL hypnotherapist may have his or her own diagnosis in such cases, this is not allowed to interfere with client self-discovery. To be sure, the proper measure of comfort is always offered with reports confusing to the client, but subjects are encouraged to make the effort to answer their own questions based upon spiritual messages that come to them during the deeper trance states. Given time and moving at their own pace, most clients ultimately see that their existence is truly a rite of passage, a transition to eventual enlightenment as souls. This process is both emotional and draining work for both. Now, see, the, the, yeah, emotionally and draining because it's like, what do you have to do to get it right, right? I mean, one thing we talk about on the channel a lot is like, this is a realm you can not please. But yet, we keep saying, oh, it's almost like, okay, you know, you, you, you were almost there. You're so close, but we need you to reincarnate at least one more time. Well, what happens? Then you get memory wiped again, you lose all the knowledge, and then, you know, it's like it's like a carrot and a stick, and it just keeps going and going and going. It's like, when is enough enough? Enlightenment as souls. This process is both emotional and draining work for both facilitator and client. But the rewards of even one LBL session are enormous in terms of acquired self-knowledge, and personal revelations of a divine plan. The authors are all certified members of the Michael Newton Institute for Life Between Lives Hypnotherapy, TNI. Besides the Americas, they practice their craft in Europe, Asia, South Africa, and Australia. The training model for our school was an outgrowth of a methodology system developed in my Los Angeles practice during many years from an extensive volume of cases, over a hundred of which have been detailed in my previously published books. There are numerous schools for traditional hypnosis and some for past life, PL, regression. Our organization was the first to exclusively offer a week-long intensive Life Between Lives training agenda, and it is the only hypnosis training program we give to professionals. Students come from all over the world to learn hands-on techniques from skilled LBL facilitators. The course practicum involves learning how to mentally regress each other into past lives and to a former existence in the spirit world between these lives. The work is both demanding and uplifting to the LBL student because they are exposed to their own spiritual insights during training. Since the authors in this book were already trained hypnotherapists with experience in their own right before I met them in the classroom, it is understandable that after graduation and certification, they have gone on to utilize their own talents and techniques in practicing spiritual regression. While they all use our LBL methodology model, each regression therapist featured in this book is different from one another in the way they assist people in uncovering memories about life after death. In my view, TNI graduates who consistently replicate the findings of those who have gone before them while adding new truths to our spiritual paradigm, bring validity to the whole process. Thus, 
you will notice a commonality of memory recall about the afterlife that is woven through all the LBL cases presented here. And, and that's exactly what we talk about on the channel are the patterns. Pattern recognition to be able to see the consistent information that's being portrayed about the afterlife in relation to the matrix. And uh, that's the beauty of modern times, right? We have access to all this information. So seeing through the deception is easier than ever. And we, boy, do we choose the right time to incarnate. EL information relevant to the case will also be included in these stories. These authors and many other certified LBL practitioners within the international network of our organization can be reached through our referral website at www.newtoninstitute.org. While many people seek us out from basic curiosity about their spiritual life, many others have acutely personal reasons. Trying to understand the loss of a child, emotional or behavioral concerns, relationship issues, or a fear of dying that they cannot resolve through traditional therapeutic means. People come to us from all walks of life with many belief systems, ranging from atheism to a fundamentalist religious persuasion. And yet, once in deep hypnosis, they all recount memories of an afterlife that is strangely uniform in concept and perception. The grandeur of this transcendental design is what brings meaning to our work, because it demonstrates order and purpose in the universe. It has been my impression over many years of public appearances that increasingly larger groups of people in all cultures are searching for a new kind of spirituality that is more personal to them. Spiritual discoveries that come from the inner mind allow for the exposure of personal truths that no outside religious intermediary or institutional affiliation can duplicate. People who have this kind of spiritual experience see a universal consciousness that is not indifferent to the actions and fates of human beings. Recognizing their own personal spirit guide specifically assigned to them, as well as interacting with soulmates and companions in their soul group during the LBL experience, adds to this conviction. The knowledge gained from such an internal revelation often leads to life-changing alterations that ease the troubled minds of the average person struggling to understand reasons for their existence on earth. This is what the cases presented here reflect. I believe the forces of intelligent creation go far beyond the religious concept of an anthropomorphic god. These spiritual forces, encountered by people in a deep trance state, indicate that creation of intelligent energy is so vast in our universe as to be incomprehensible to the human mind. However, the eternal soul mind sees connections to a series of higher beings in the afterlife, who are not gods but rather more advanced souls who have completed their own physical incarnations and are available to serve others who have not finished their karmic work. These evolved teachers are part of the link of a higher consciousness that brings elements of a grand design into the human brain from the soul mind. I call those facilitators who assist in the art of uniting a conscious human brain with the unconscious immortal soul spiritual integrationists. Each of us has this mental dualism in our nature, which may be confusing to people in a fully conscious state. This potential problem is what LBL hypnotherapy endeavors to resolve with people who come to us for help. Through the integration of mind and spirit, we seek to assist them with self-revelations concerning the age-old questions of Who am I? Where do I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? The LBL practitioner facilitates their hypnosis subject on a spiritual journey to unravel these personal mysteries and bring greater awareness and meaning to their life by fostering understanding about who they really are as a person. Learning how one's immortal soul character unites with a temporary human brain to produce one personality for one lifetime is rather like a cosmic experience for people. Once this unconscious duality of... A cosmic experience of bullshit. The true identity of the soul is exposed. It becomes so liberating 
that often clients emerge from an LBL session with new serenity and spiritual transcendence. In my lectures, writings, and radio shows, I have often explained to the public that I was originally resistant to the New Age movement. By training, I was a traditional therapist who specialized in hypnotherapy. Initially, I was not even particularly metaphysical in my approach to client difficulties involving the need for behavior modification. This outlook began to change after my initial past-life discovery, followed sometime later by my first Life Between Life case in 1968, which will be described shortly. However, it would take years of research before I had enough data to properly map the spirit world and develop a sequential methodology for asking questions. By 1980, I realized I should prepare to write a book on my findings, and therefore I kept more detailed records. Thus, many of the cases in my books stem from the 1980s and 1990s. Also, my skill level as an LBL hypnotherapist and my knowledge of the spirit world was much greater in these decades than in the earlier years. As with so many other significant events over the years, my early revelations about an afterlife in the spirit world seemed to arrive on my doorstep rather by accident. I now realize there are no accidents in the scheme of things, especially for major events. This is what the people whose cases are discussed in this book have come to know as well. My small case contribution is not as complex as many of the cases you are about to hear. Because it was my first LBL case, it will always be embedded in my memory as the beginning of fulfilling my purpose in this life. To offer a new, very personal spiritual belief system without the need for institutions or intermediaries. I would title the following condensed story, The Missing Friends. A middle-aged woman whose name was Una came to me with problems that centered around her feelings of isolation and a kind of dissociation with humanity. This lady told me that she felt a terrible yearning to be with her old friends, whom she could not clearly define. Una mentioned that she had seen some evidence of them in dreams, but at this stage in my career I did not understand the full implications of that statement. At our first meeting, during intake, I felt that while there was evidence of sadness, coupled with lack of energy and motivation, Una was not someone suffering from mental illness, nor was she on antidepressant medication. My assessment was that despite being chronically lonely, Una was not antisocial, and even appeared to evidence peer engagement in her life. After I questioned Una further, I determined she was manifestly depressed over what she stated was the absence of a meaningful connection with anyone who recognizes my real identity as a person. I saw that Una was grieving, but quite functional. Yet there was an aspect to her discomfort that was clinically rather vague. During the early stages of her session, I asked, Are these missing friends people you knew at any time in your adult life? Una answered no. We then began to Hello, Michael. Michael, and in a shallow alpha state. I asked her. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> I guess I opened up something by accident. Sorry. Any childhood playmates who are no longer with you? Again, her answer was no. As I took Una deeper into the middle and upper levels of the Alpha State, we began to explore her most recent past life, and even a couple of earlier past lives. Only a few friends dear to her began to crop up although these souls were not visualized by Una as connected, because she was not yet mentally in the spirit world. However, she was visibly brightening as the session progressed. Una then told me that she wanted to see all her friends together, interacting with her, and this was why she felt so isolated and lonely in her current life. At the time, I thought this comment rather odd. At this point in the session, due to my inexperience in spiritual matters, I was getting somewhat frustrated. More importantly, what I did not fully realize was the fact that this highly receptive woman was taking her trance phase into the deeper hypnotic theta state in order to help both of us. I did not know that Una was getting ahead of me and actually pushing herself from a subconscious mode into what we call today a superconscious mental state, 
which allows a subject in hypnosis to mentally reach the spirit world between lives. Finally, in my bafflement, I asked Una, was there ever a time in your existence when you were not lonely? Be- in, in my bafflement? What was that? Actually pushing herself from a subconscious mode into what we call today a superconscious mental state, which allows a subject in hypnosis to He's mentally reach the spirit world between kind of lives. Finally, in my bafflement, I asked <laughs> Una, was there ever a time in your existence when you were not lonely because you were with a group of friends? Suddenly she cried out in excitement and said yes. I immediately commanded, go there. What I did not realize at the time was the fact that I had inadvertently used a trigger word, group. To someone in deep hypnosis visualizing the afterlife, this means a spirit group of connected souls who are especially active together between lives and often incarnate together. Una was now crying with happiness, and with her eyes still closed, she was pointing to my office wall. Oh, I see them now, she said. I asked where. She answered, in my home. My confused response was, You mean at home in one of your past lives? No, no, Una replied eagerly. I'm in between. Don't you see? In the spirit world. This is my real home, and my soul group is all here. She then said, tearfully, Oh, I miss them so much. I was dumbfounded by what had happened to both of us, and still did not fully comprehend what we had found together. With more questioning, I learned that no primary soulmate or supporting soul companions were in Una's current life, because she had been too dependent upon them during her past incarnations on Earth. This was a karmic learning lesson involving a prior spiritual contract for her current life. By not physically being with Una in her life today, Members of her soul group gave her the space to grow stronger through the challenges of being alone. Once Una understood this situation in her life was by advance mutual agreement with her soul group and spiritual advisors, she began to relax, and her sense of loss diminished. Over the next year, Una would contact me regularly with updates to say that life for her now had new meaning, and she was living it to the fullest— because she finally comprehended her purpose, involving a need for courage and independence in decision-making. She derived great comfort from knowing her immortal soul companions would be waiting for her on the other side. Una's new feelings of fulfillment, as an outgrowth of her first LBL session, caused her to realize that life was not governed by fate or determinism or some sort of divine punishment surrounding her loneliness, but rather by her own free will. This does not mean that I offer Una... Okay, so, yes, true, but the problem is, is we are not getting the breakdown of how, of the deception. Even though we all, you know, many who have looked into the, the Matrix Reincarnation Soul Trap see it and have gotten to a certain point where you can say, oh, well, these experiencer cases lead us down the path to discovery... It's it, everything is always whitewashed and, and, and excused away endlessly. And it just it, it's incredible how this realm and how it functions, the inherent um, flaws that just the human body has can be excused away. The atrocities, everything that comes with it. Right. I'm not saying it's all bad. But what I am saying is, is, you know, there, there could have been whoever runs this place. It could have been a lot better. Like if we came in here, you know, just to experience, to experience and, 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 you know, Hey, just come into a realm and do something different. And which is exactly what I think we all did. It, there was some sort of level of curiosity And when you don't have something to compare it to, like pain, like suffering, love, joy, happiness, if you you don't have a gauge to compare that to, 
Well, it's easy to see how you can come in here and get lost and, and agree to come in here and at the same time uh, just completely be inundated by this sensory experience. So, uh, you, know, I, 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 you know, I'm the type of guy who just is sick of the excuses. You know, I call out this reality for what it is. Don't allow it to, you know, make excuses and put it to task because that's really important. It really is because uh, there's always just like the endless excuses, the endless um, just uh, submissiveness that happens with humanity and, and, and the afterlife. It's like. What happens when someone stands up for themselves and says, I'm not going to deal with any of this bullshit anymore? What happens then? And that's what this channel is all about. It's all about empowering everyone as an individual and just seeing what happens. Instead of just blindly lining up, going along with the show, and hoping that everything is as advertised and, you know, it's all love and light and, you know, God loves you and God's looking out for you and all that stuff. No, I mean, what's wrong with taking, forging your own path as an individual sovereign being and seeing what happens? I don't see anything wrong with that. And remember, if, if we're all wrong, if we're all sitting here and, and you know, this place is, is the ultimate reality, not just Earth, but the Matrix is the ultimate reality. Well, guess what? Since everything is love and light and God loves us, then it surely would welcome us back, right? Just saying. It's, it's, you can't lose in this type of situation because, again, if, this, if the system is as advertised, then it would respect and understand that you would take the sovereign path and just... And throw up non-interference i'm not going to go over all that right now but you but that's the point it's like this realm should be you know this whole matrix system this god whatever we want to call it creator source if it exists would be completely understanding and welcoming to us you know if we went our own way or lost our way and decided to come back but if you flip those things around and don't do it and just go along with the show and kind of align with, with the pack, with the hive mind, then you're kind of done, right? Like you, 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 you didn't even set yourself up in a position to be there, to, to be able to at least try it. And I think that's exactly what this realm hopes we do. It wants us to just be a mindless drone and agree to everything and not ask questions. And a see for depression. Rather, it shows another avenue for the exploration of an unsettled mind. I would like to quote Una's last letter to me, sent years after her session and just before her death. Michael. I am no longer a solitary being within myself. Rather than existing solely in my private world as before, I now find that I coexist easily with others, because I am attuned to the fact we all live in a shared world where none of us need to be limited by boundaries. These days I find myself encouraging people in distress to accept life and who they are. Do, do, you, do, you, do you realize how ridiculous that is? I don't want to be limited by boundaries or this or that. But yet, when it comes to the afterlife, the Matrix marketing department, it's like, oh, I'm just going to submit and hope for the best. So, <laughs> ah, just frustrating to hear that, right? It's like you're, you're rooting forever the, who, to, for whoever the individual is to do what they need to do for themselves. Not the collective, not the hive mind. Private world as before. I now find that I coexist easily with others because I am attuned to the fact we all live in a shared world 
where none of us need to be limited by boundaries. These days I find myself encouraging people in distress to accept life and who they are and enjoy what is good and intended in our world. Thank you for this gift. Una's session with me had sent cold chills down my spine, with its profound, far-reaching implications. After she left, I spent considerable time reviewing her tape recording. Her case marked the beginning of my investigations into the afterlife, or inner life, as some call this spiritual realm. I was now in uncharted territory. At the time, there were no books that I could find about spiritual regression methodology. The conventional wisdom among most past-life researchers during this period, and indeed for years afterward, was that memory recall of life between lives only involved a non-productive grayish limbo of no consequence. Perhaps this attitude was influenced by the millions of adherents to an Eastern philosophical concept involving the absence of a permanent soul self in human beings who transmigrate from life to life without a spiritual essence of everlasting personal identity. As for myself, I felt a compulsion to discover everything possible about our life after death through spiritual recall. This task would take years of quiet study as I worked with hypnosis subjects, designing a methodology that included an entry and exit strategy to the afterlife. While mapping the spirit world from a great many case histories, a magnificent truth became evident to me. I found that within the mind of every person lies the answer to the mystery of their life. Finally, in 1994, my first work, Journey of Souls, was published by Llewellyn, followed by Destiny of Souls in 2000. These two books provide a foundation of understanding about life in the spirit world and reincarnation. In 2004, a third book, Life Between Lives Hypnotherapy offered both the public and private hypnosis professional a functional step-by-step -step guide to spiritual regression methodology. Representing some 35 years of research, this text shows interested audiences how information was obtained for memories of the afterlife by detailing the hypnosis process used with all the cases presented here. I should like to offer a further word about these books. In this collection of cases, the authors may briefly allude to certain aspects of LBL methodology relating to their case that they are unable to describe completely without spoiling the pace of their short stories. In those cases where I felt the more detailed information would provide the curious listener with greater understanding about a particular aspect of the afterlife, I offer notes with further commentary. As therapists, we honor the beliefs and perceptions of our clients during their LBL sessions. The editor's notes in this book are not intended to detract from any inquiry by the facilitator or client statement, but rather to offer the interested listener additional detail on the same topic, as described by many other hypnosis subjects reporting about their spiritual life. While there is some repetition between cases, I wanted each story to have the benefit of notes that apply directly to the subject under discussion and to stand on its own for ease of listener appraisal. Although intensely powerful, life between lives hypnotherapy is still a relatively new field. The authors of this book will attest to the fact that when their hypnosis subjects find they have a definite purpose in life and do not lose their real personhood at physical death, this knowledge brings them overwhelming joy. Each author has chosen a case from their files that best reflects a particular theme of special interest to them. In our editing, we have tried to select stories that offer a variety of personal situations for broad audience identification. It is our hope and expectation that these stories involving the conscious illumination of the soul will demonstrate a therapeutic form of healing that one day will be in general use everywhere among traditional therapists. I trust you will enjoy the cases that follow. May they bring you an awareness of what is possible in your own life. Michael Newton, editor and founder of the Newton Institute. Okay, so that is the intro. What I'm going to do really quickly is just uh, go to a blank transition. So it's kind of like 
in between cases, I'll just do this very briefly so it's easier for timestamps and for anyone who's watching the replay. All right, so now we're going to get into the casework. And um, this one is about a half hour on track two. And I believe there's one or two cases reviewed in it. And it starts off as a doozy. So <laughs> let's get into it. One. Love. Oh, you know, I'm sorry. I do want to give a big welcome to Sovereign Being for joining the Last Timers Club. I appreciate you. And for Knack, your very kind super chat. I appreciate both of you. Thank you so much. And for everyone else who supports the channel, thank you so much. I appreciate you. By Paul O'Rand, New York City. President and lead trainer for the Michael Newton Institute. International instructor, author, and award-winning master hypnotherapist. Many seek life between lives hypnotherapy, longing to know if they will ever meet their soulmates. This is a story of a young woman who has recently met her soulmate. But this time, rather than to be together, he has come into her life as a catalyst for change. As the session progresses, we find this is actually his second attempt to wake her up and help her learn the soul lessons she has been struggling with for lifetimes. Sasha is a 32-year-old woman born in Northern Europe. After a 12-year relationship with Mark, the first and only man in her life, plans were made for their fairy tale wedding. Two weeks... Uh, full disclosure, it's not me. <laughs> Sasha's soulmate, Raoul, showed up and rocked her world. Not knowing what to do, Sasha followed through with her wedding plans and married Mark. Despite keeping her commitment to Mark, she was torn and found herself pushing him away. She was never able to be really intimate with him, and a few months later she moved away from Mark to live and work in Portugal. They have been apart for almost six months. During their time apart, Sasha crossed paths with Raoul again. They became lovers for a brief time, and then Raoul moved on. Sasha was devastated. She came into our session feeling terribly guilty and confused. Sasha wonders if she is to be with her soulmate Raoul, or if she should stay married and go back to her husband Mark. She is seeking advice from her guides and direction for her soul. During an LBL session, we normally direct a client back to the most recent past life. On occasion, when there is an earlier lifetime of great significance, a client will go to that lifetime rather than the most recent one. This is what developed in this case. The opening scene in Sasha's past life is of an Egyptian temple. She is a priestess named Sharun, engaged in spiritual studies. Our conversation about this life unfolds as follows. Sasha, I am learning about spirituality but I am also practicing manipulating people who don't work in the temple. I am able to influence them spiritually and energetically. Paul, help me understand how you manipulate them. Sasha, I manipulate them to be obedient, to believe what I want them to believe. I do it through creating and sending images. I create a mental image of what I want them to do and I send it. They can see it and feel it. It is very powerful. It is easy to influence them. Paul, move forward in that life of spiritual... It, it is easy to enforce them. And I send it. They can see it and feel it. It is very powerful. It is easy to influence them. Paul, Move forward in that life of spiritual studies and manipulation. What happens? Sasha, I am killed. Yes, killed. Paul, and how does that happen? Sasha, there are enemy invaders. They are entering the temple and they are killing everybody. They kill me too. Paul, what happens to you? Where are you in relation to your body now? Sasha. Outside, very quickly. I am just observing. I watch as more people enter the temple. 
but I don't feel sad. I feel peaceful. I am accepting. Paul, where do you go and what do you do? Sasha, up and up, looking back on the scene. I see light up and to the left. I'm going toward it. I move toward it without any effort. It is very peaceful. Paul, what happens as you reach this light? Sasha, surprised. I am not very religious, but I see an image of a holy person with his arms wide open, welcoming me. I know this is a symbol of loving bliss. I can see now. It is my guide who is there. I feel safe. All right. Roll out the guide. Tells me everything is fine. Oh, everything's doing very fine. well. You're you're doing great. You got everybody under control. You're doing wonderful. Supports me, and loves me. He just melted into me. We are one. This is melted into him. They are one. So this is the Matrix marketing department merging with a. Eh, I guess we'll say an unsuspecting or fully knowing being who is doing damage here on Earth and manipulating the minds. Incredible. It's a way of experiencing his vibrations. His vibrations. He's very wise and joyful. So bright and so pure. Paul, <laughs> why does your guide merge with you in this way? Because he, because he's part of the Matrix Marketing Department. That's the translation, sorry. Later on, I will know his vibrations, so his that vibrations. when I need his help, and when I meditate, I will know he is with me. I will feel his peace and joy. Paul, and where does he guide you next? Sasha, we are in a beautiful rose garden, sitting on a bench. There are pedestrian walkways. At the end of the path, there is a building. It is wide. As I look at it, I realize I can go there to ask questions. But I am afraid to do that. Paul, and how does Araton respond to your being afraid to ask questions? Sasha, he says I don't have to ask questions if I am not comfortable now. He says I can do it later on. We are going to do some healing I am to follow him. It is strange. I know he is radiating love, but I cannot feel it. He says we can fix it. Now I am in a healing chamber. From the top, it is like a machine producing different colored rays of light. Sasha shakes in the chair. I can feel that I am vibrating. I don't have to do anything. It is just happening. I'm feeling very peaceful. There is a soft but penetrating pink light cleansing my body inside and out. Editor's Note Typically, orientation with our guides right after physical death includes visualizations of quiet, peaceful areas. This deprogramming is designed as a moderate measure in dealing with soul contamination. Rather, yeah, 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 yeah. It's just a soul contamination. So, you know, just got to, you know, remove your inner knowing, your memories, you know. It's all part of decontamination. You know, you'll be all right. No big deal. And then you'll be wiped fully and right back at it again. Designed as a moderate measure in dealing with soul contamination rather than severe soul rejuvenation, which requires more drastic action. The spiritual garden-type scene as described in this case may also include what many call a cleansing shower of healing. The symbolism of flowing energy for purification is often evoked by the client reliving such scenes. Paul, what is it that is being cleansed from you? Sasha. Your memories. There is still some kind of fear that I am holding in my ethereal abdomen that should be cleansed that is connected to love. It is why I had trouble feeling Ariton's love. Paul, 
Where does this fear associated with love originate? Sasha. From many lifetimes. This healing and vibrating. Go- so, see, he's saying, where, where does this fear originate from? Answer, from many lifetimes. Just like what we were talking about at the beginning. Why is that? Why is that? This realm feasts off of what, you know, for lack of a better term, it's called louche, right? Our energy. And it could be positive energy. It could be negative energy. But it seems from, you know, looking at it from a very, very common sense perspective that this realm feasts off the negative energy. It, it, it gets more louche and creative energies from the negative. That's not to say it's not feasting off of the positive too, but it's incredible. I mean, do you think that this individual or any of us deserve to reincarnate and have all these, this baggage behind us and it's in the freaking subconscious it's tucked away and you don't even know it exists and maybe just maybe you're lucky enough to go and face you know and and book a regression meet a a hypnotherapist who can help you or perhaps somebody else and get into trance and work on these things but if you don't know that this type of thing exists like probably what, 90% of the rest of the world? Well, you're just going to be carrying that along with you the, your whole time here. How fair, is, how, uh, how fair is that? Seriously. Big questions here to ask. You, you, this reality cannot be explained away so easily. Then Sasha reports it is complete. Paul, with this healing complete, If we were to hold up a full-length mirror, how would you appear? Sasha. Clean. A blue color with some pinkish tints. Paul. We know your guide's name is Araton, but what is your immortal spiritual name? Sasha. Long pause. I hear something like Kaya, but I'm not sure. Paul, perhaps you can ask your guide. Sasha, he says this is a name from a past life. My immortal spiritual name sounds something like Kashiapaya. Paul, and now that this healing is complete, where does your guide take you? Sasha, I am in front of a group of beings. There are five of them. We are in a round room. I feel so safe. Ariton is with me. He is standing to my side and slightly behind me. At first they all appear in the same brown color, but now the one in the middle is white, and one of the other ones is a reddish color. Paul, what happens here? Sasha, I am just waiting. Now they are welcoming me. They want to help me live my life fully. My client is now engaged with this group of beings who are on her council, often called the elders or wise ones. There is a long pause here, while Sasha collects her thoughts and visualizes the council members preparing to work with her. Paul. Roll out the council members. What are they communicating to you? Sasha. You've got to go back. It is like a wall on the right-hand side of the room. It is sort of a screen. I see three scenes. In one, it looks like me giving birth, and there is someone next to me, a man I don't recognize. I don't want to see this. Paul, what is your hesitation? Sasha, the man in the scene where I'm giving birth is not my husband or Raoul. I don't like that. Uh-oh. I want it to be Raoul. They are showing me three scenes. There is one scene with the man I don't recognize. In this scene, I am having a baby. There is one in the middle where I am with Raoul. And this scene is very bright, although this is not the most probable or best one. 
Somehow I know this is true, but I don't understand why it is brighter than the other two choices. I'm scared. The scene to the far right is me with my husband, Mark. Oh, I see. They are showing me I have a choice. I can choose to be with my husband or the other man. I can even choose to be with Raoul. That is strange. I have three choices. Editor's Note There are a number of I'm scared expressions in this story by Sasha, the client, that demonstrate uncertainty with her spiritual visions. This sort of emotional fear does not actually come from Kashyapaya, her soul, even though Sasha is in a deep theta trance state. In a pure discarnate state, Souls may be uneasy about a loved one still on earth who is in trouble, or perhaps just before they appear before their counsel. But emotional fear from the central nervous system in a physical body does not exist for souls in the spirit world. What we have here with Sasha's visual... Yeah, yeah, except, you know, what happens is, is it's you, you're love-bombed to death, like cults do. That's exactly what cults do. Oh, love, love, love me. Kiss me, kiss me. Love, 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 love. And then, boom, all of a sudden, you you know, you're like uh, doing free work for decades in a, in a gulag of a church. You know, I mean, it's just incredible. Just overlook the love bomb. Literally, the light or so-called source or God or... Jesus or Buddha or Muhammad, whatever the case may be, uh, however your belief system is, is what you will be presented. And the light is the, the facilitator of that to give you that like um, strong connection, that love bomb. And then what does it do? It turns around and knifes you in the back and, and, and what? You end up back here? Or maybe you get a little time to chill in the astral realm and, and regain your composure. And then boom, all of a sudden, all right, well, it's time to go back. You have an important mission to do. You've got to go down and help others or you need to resolve this karma. I mean, it's just, it's the same thing over and over again. Fear from the central nervous system in a physical body does not exist for souls in the spirit world. What we have here with Sasha's visual reactions to her council presentation of three alternate current life scenes is an uncertain woman reacting to what she is seeing. She is engaged in a current life review within the now time of the spirit world, where past, present, and future are all rolled into one timeline interview. This represents a what-if exercise for the examination of possibilities and probabilities, with LBL therapy, the client may bring conscious mind transmissions into their unconscious, where the human ego becomes integrated into recollections of a soul ego. Paul, a soul do you want ego. to ask them which choice would be of the highest good for your soul? Sasha, long pause. I have asked, but they are not going to tell me. <laughs> they say I must. I have asked, but they're not going to tell me. Oh, it's, it's so love and light of them. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, that's so bad. That's so, so diabolical. Make my own decision without their influence. Here, the council is having Kashyapaya, who in her past life as Sharun influenced and manipulated many people, experience how important it is for one to be free to make choices in life. And, as is often the case, they teach her this by talking to her about it, but also by giving her the experience of choice free from even their influence. Paul, I pose one of the questions that Sasha has brought to me before our session began. Perhaps you want to ask them why Raoul came into your life as he did. Sasha, to show me how to relax and feel joy. He came to open me up, to help me open to other people. And to My the closest matrix. friend has always been Mark. We were all... Oh, Klaus Schwab enters the chat. How to relax and feel joy. He came to open me up, to help me open to other people. 
My closest friend has always been Mark. Oh, closest. We were always together <laughs> and had no outside friends. We were in sort of a shell or cocoon, closed and separate from others, in our own little world. Raoul has come into my life to wake me up and break that shell open. He came as a catalyst for change. He came to help me learn how to love. That's why I now have many friends and am traveling the world for business. That is what has brought me here. Editor's Note The current life review Sasha is receiving from her counsel demonstrates the conflict we may feel by having more than one love partner in our life, even though prearranged. Notice the dynamics between her two loves today. Sasha discovers it is Mark who is her primary soulmate over thousands of years of lives. We were always together. Raoul has come into her current life, as he has from time to time in other lives, as a companion soulmate, also from the same soul group. He has come as a catalyst for change for Sasha, because in this life and in her current body, she is a manipulator of love and must come to terms with what love is all about. Paul, I ask another of Sasha's pre-session questions. Do you want to tell them how guilty you feel about your relationship with Raoul? Sasha, they say it is okay. It will be washed away. It already is. They say there is nothing to be guilty about. They say it was necessary to shake me that much so that I would make some decisions and make some changes in how I live. Paul, I pose another of Sasha's questions. Do they advise you to go back to the marriage? Sasha. No, they don't advise me to go back. They say it is my choice. I have freedom of choice. Paul. Perhaps you want to ask them what the best thing is now for your soul growth. Sasha. It is very strange. Now I feel sad and afraid. After a pause, Sasha continues. Acceptance and letting go of things, to let things happen, to accept life and let go. Okay, so see, this is this is a common narrative pushed throughout the Matrix, right? Just let go, just just do as you're told, you know, just submit. Don't ask questions, and if you're going to ask questions, we're going to make sure to provide you a one-way ticket to Matrixville. I mean, it really, it's, it's endless how much the deception presents itself. I mean, it, it's right in front of our face. Just submit, believe, you know, have faith, and everything will be okay. And not to control. Don't, to not manipulate yeah, things or people. Yeah. Just let, to observe, to see what happens. Let, uh, let the matrix manipulate you. Don't take your own initiative. Don't take the sovereign path. Let the Matrix manipulate you. No big deal. It's to my lifetime as the priestess and manipulating. This is scary. I don't know if I will be able to be with Raoul. I know I want to be with him, but he has his free will too. I don't know if he wants to be together. They show me on the screen how life with Raoul could be. It would be nice, spiritual and calm. I see two children... I am not sure which country it is. It is a very peaceful and happy life, but he has to want it too. Paul, you might ask them what the possibility of that is in this life. Sasha, it's only about a 20 or 30 percent possibility. 20 percent. I am scared it will not happen. The point is that I want it and he does not. He has his free will, too, and I am not supposed to manipulate it. He has to want it, too. Oh, this is hard. Soul lessons such as these are often a struggle to get, and Kashyapaya is really struggling here. She is so set on having her way that it is almost impossible for her to even look at the different possibilities for her life, let alone take in the deeper soul lesson her counsel is presenting her with. It can take lifetimes to resolve certain tendencies we carry in our souls. And this seems to be a pivotal lifetime for Kashyapaya. It could take lifetimes. Lifetimes. I mean, that should be a red flag in and of itself. 
You know what else is another red flag? We've talked about, um, I don't remember which one it was, one of his books. He was going over many, many cases, which I think on the channel we've gone over a total between the, the first two books, well over 100. I want to say like maybe 120. Uh, one of the cases that sticks out, and there are many, but one that really sticks out is the is the case where someone talks about how they have either worked 5,000 lifetimes or 5,000 years just on empathy alone. Just on empathy alone. So they can compartmentalize down to the most basic of human uh, traits or experiences like empathy and get someone to believe that they need to continue working on that. How could someone need that amount of time to dedicate just to empathy? If Again, if that's not a red flag, I don't know what it is. And, you know, granted that's a previous case, but this is how the system works. It's, it's based on a rooted, deeply rooted deception. So let's presenting her with. It can take lifetimes to resolve certain tendencies we carry in our souls. And this seems to be a pivotal lifetime for Kashyapaya. Sasha, they are talking to me about choices again. You have the freedom of choice. That involves others' choices, too. I don't like it. I don't know why. I don't want this to happen. I am scared, really. Paul, by showing you these choices, what is it they are trying to communicate to you? Long pause still struggling with what they are showing her. Sasha, all these lives, in current time simulation, meet at the same point in the end, but they are different. Paths. Paul, I ask another of Sasha's pre-session questions. Do you want to ask them if any of these three men they are showing you are soulmates? Sasha, long pause. I don't know. I am so scared to see. Kashyapaya is having so much difficulty accepting what her counsel is teaching her that her guide Araton steps in. He suggests we leave the council meeting for the time being while reassuring Kashyapaya that she will be able to return if she wishes. Araton takes her immediately to her soul group. Editor's Note In LBL Therapy, during periods of the session involving difficult scenes for the client, facilitators often call on the subject's personal spirit guide to assist. This is especially true with client blocks. In this case, the client was guided to mentally shift from a council scene to that of her soul group, and it was very therapeutic because she began to relax. So, again, it's like once they reach a certain point in the regression or the life between lives, they are going to be, you know, in the, um, the quote unquote guide or the council is familiar to the, um, I guess we'll say patient, even though Newton doesn't like that, but, um, the experiencer, well, they kind of roll them in. And what is that? That's a matrix marketing department representative. Whether they're doing it knowingly or unknowingly, it doesn't matter. It's happening. And then certain narratives are uh, um, pushed or certain narratives may be squashed. And yeah, it may provide comfort, but at the same time, it's just what's going on here. We all have these uh, soul groups, these guys, these teachers, this council, all this stuff that is part of the grand deception and trying to rob us of our sovereignty. So what's the next step to say, screw all that. I want nothing to do with it. But, you know, at least you can extract information out of something like these sessions like we're going over in the book. We are already here. I can see my mom, Raoul, and others. I see eight people standing in two groups, 
four on the left and four on the right. My mom is in the middle of the group on the left, and in the group on the right are Raoul, Mark, and Andy, a new and close friend. Paul. And who comes forward first? Sasha. My mom comes forward to greet me, and then steps back. Then Raoul comes forward. He is making jokes with me. He teases me. I don't know what he is talking about, but he is very funny and really joyful. He isn't that joyful in real life. He is often very distant and even cold. But here he is very warm and funny. He says, Take it easy. Don't push. Follow your heart. Allow yourself to follow the guidance. I am so scared. I am telling him I want to be with him. I feel the pain. Maybe. Maybe, baby. He jokes. I am so angry. Editor's Note A soul's immortal character may be in opposition with the brain and the emotional temperament of their human host. Paul Ask him why he came into your life now. Sasha This was the last opportunity to change my life to open me up and to show me there are many other possibilities. I was closed and shut down, and he has... Closed and shut down, but, you know, of course, you know, you have the minder, like in North Korea, sitting in the background saying, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't start thinking for yourself. We'll be sure to butt in and make sure that, you know, you follow and toe the line. And he has opened me up. He tried to do this for me before in another life. I was quite reserved and couldn't open up to him. I didn't stay with him. That was very painful for him. This is one reason he is quite reluctant to be with me this time. He is afraid I will leave him and he will be alone again. He says he couldn't bear that again. Paul, what did you two agree to in advance of this current life? Sasha, sometimes we are together and sometimes we are not. In this lifetime there are times we are together and times we are not. There will be a period without being together, and there may be another period after some time when we will be together. But he is checking other possibilities, too. I must wait for him to decide. I cannot control it. He has to choose. I cannot control it. He has to choose. Key words right there. I must wait for him to decide. I cannot control it. He has to choose. I tell him that I love him. Cries. Long pause. We embrace. Now Mark comes forward. Both Mark and Raoul are in my soul group. He is happy that I am here. But he is sad that we have been apart. I, too, am sad about this. I tell him I am sorry if I have hurt him. I tell him I love him. Paul. And what is the agreement that you and he have? Sasha. To be together. To love and support each other. To learn as much as we can from each other. To be friends. We are hugging. I am confused. I am feeling this sadness and fear again. My mom and my friend Andy are there, just standing, looking at me. I feel their love and support. I want to move on. But there in the group on the right is that guy from one of the three possibilities shown to me by my counsel. But I don't want to talk to him. He is close to me, but it is hard for me to see him. I am so scared he is not right for me. My guide Ariton is saying he can support me, and he is wondering if I want to talk. He says whoever I am with will be fine. My life will be fulfilled. This is difficult for me to hear, but Ariton is telling me I need to work on acceptance. He is acceptance, saying I have yeah. free will, and there are different possibilities, but I am not sure which I should choose. All right, so care. right there... 
I have free will, but I'm not sure what I should choose. Well, roll out the Matrix marketing department and slap me sideways. I mean, it's it, it's so insane how obvious it's like, okay, yeah, you have free will, but you're still under the spell of this system. These parasites, uh, or, you know, they might not even be parasites. Remember, some beings that are involved with this could be involved knowingly or unknowingly. We don't know. Think about it. Like if, if this is kind of how I look at it, if you have a, a system set up and, and the matrix knows, right. That you're maybe catching on a little too much for its comfort then wouldn't it be smart to have a system in place where it's like, oh, there's like this fake graduation party. Oh, you've graduated the earth realm and blah, blah, blah. And now you have been promoted and you can help others down on earth achieve their level of uh, ascension or liberation. But what is that doing? It just kind of funnels everything right back into the same system. And there's a whole group of entities involved that think they're doing a good thing because they've quote unquote ascended and in all reality all they're doing is further perpetuating the system that's kind of like what my gut tells me is going on i'm not 100 percent sure certain on that but i'm pretty sure i mean it it, it really makes sense you know, there's only so much that the the AI system or whatever, the simulation, whatever you want to call it, can do as a program until you need, like, um, personalized interjections from some true essence beings, but from true essence beings that are lost and still under the spell of the Matrix. That's where I think the dividing line kind of comes in. Now, that's just my opinion. Uh, it's a strong opinion, but I mean, really, it makes sense. Like, if you're if you're looking at it from a, a parasitic controller of this place, what would you rather do? Would you rather lose that individual, or would you rather, you know, put on this grand display and hire them to do your dirty work? You know, that's why, like, you know, the whole spirit guide things. Uh, I don't necessarily, you know, I feel bad for anyone that's kind of in that position because even though they don't have to deal with the pain and suffering of being down here, they're still in, trapped within the system and lost in the sauce. So it's tough. It's tough. And then, of course, who knows, you know, where you divide the line between what is like an AI simulated response type perceived being versus you know a true essence being that just completely lost in the sauce uh we'll never know that answer at least while we're here but either one it's it's the it doesn't matter in the end because it's the same result you know i'm your guide i'm your counsel i'm your teacher you know i'm your, part of your soul group or whatever the case may be and you know i'm here to help blah 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 follow me do this do that and don't ask any questions and if you start asking questions i'll be sure to interject and and make you feel like you know th there's this grand purpose to all of this I me mean, i need to go back to the council for this pause the council we are now there they are asking me what my question is after her initial meeting with her council... Yeah, what's your initial question? Hey, ho, oh, what are you doing coming into my council room? Oh, you want a fresh one? After her initial meeting with her council and her soul group intervention, Kashyapaya is now far more ready to hear the deeper message that the council is communicating to her. Sasha. It is all about acceptance. All the best for me is happening. I still don't understand. Should I follow what is happening, or should I create my life? I don't understand. Should I make choices, or should I just allow choices to be made? Sometimes...
Sometimes they have to be allowed to be made. Oh my God, I'm talking away and have my mic off. I'm sorry. Anyways, um, oh, I'm sorry. Anyways, one of the common, I thought I hit the button, but I guess I missed it. <laughs> uh, one of the common narratives out there is that the guides have our best interests at heart, right? And, you know, it's like, oh, I'm just going to, to hope, and, you know what? Let me just back it up a minute because I, I'm sorry, guys. I I've had a lot to say on this. I still don't understand best acceptance. All the best for me is happening. I still don't understand. Should I follow what is happening, or should I create my life? All the best is happening. Should I follow, or should I create my life? Should I make choices? Or should I just allow choices to be made? Should I make choices or allow choices to be made on my behalf? Sometimes they have to be allowed to be made. Sometimes they have to be allowed to be made. See, like this is where the disconnect comes in, right? It's, it's frustrating. Um, and you can see how a level of manipulation can be achieved in this type of thinking. And this is exactly how the system works. Whether you're consciously or unconsciously doing it, doesn't matter. It, 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 it's lined up in a way for you to kind of just fall right into it. And I guess... Again, it kind of reverts back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the stream. What's wrong with you taking the sovereign approach? Well, I mean, if you have free will and can make these decisions, don't get lost in the sauce. Don't fall into this repetitive, endless cycle of death and rebirth, or at least being a pawn inside the matrix. You deserve better than that, and you're not going to know unless you try. You can make one. We're all not going to know unless we try. I mean, really, like, that's that's kind of, like, the big kind of uh, <laughs> uh, overwhelming proof, right, of, of everything. It's, uh, it's sad. It's sad. But we deserve better, and we will get better because we're not going to submit. We're not just going to bend over and, and take it and think that, oh, well, just because, you know, they're saying this or they're saying that, that it's noble and righteous and everything like that. No, no. Those days are over, at least for me to be allowed and to many be of you. In this particular situation, I can make the choice. I can leave Mark. I can choose to be with Raul. But I don't know how to do it if he doesn't want to. No matter what, I have to respect the choices of others and not manipulate them to get what I want. Paul, I ask another of Sasha's priests. Okay, so not manipulate them, but yet the system that's overruling you is manipulating you. Again, uh, you know, as if... You know, your your path on Earth is like this incredible, uh, noble expedition that must be a certain way. I want. Paul, I ask another of Sasha's pre-session questions. What do you need to do at this time in your life? Sasha, 
meditate and calm myself down, send love, accept his, Raoul's, free will. I am asking the council if they can project some images about our future life together, see possibilities, and open myself to the possibilities, but be emotionally detached and not project them to others to influence things. They are saying that I have a tendency toward stubbornness and that I need to make the effort to move on and not stay stuck. I should move on with my life and follow my intuition. They say... I follow your intuition as it pertains to the Matrix. See, this is, um, this is one of the things I've talked about a lot, especially in my earlier videos, and it's, it's really important. And I'm, and I'm sure many of you can relate on this to some level. There have been things like your intuition really is a, a great gauge. But discernment and intuition can, not always, but it can steer you wrong. Whereas like one of the big narratives out there is that, oh, you know, intuition, you can't go wrong. Most of the time, yes, intuition is spot on. I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's not, but at the same time, there is, I am convinced just based on my path through this insane asylum is that it can be tweaked. It can be manipulated a little bit. I'm not talking about the times when you're driving down the road and, and all of a sudden you decide to, to take another way versus the, the, you know, the same way you're going to work every day. Like if you, if that's what's coming through to you, take the other way. Don't, you know, don't sit there and, and take a chance because it, most likely if you're in that position, you're right. There, there's some sort of inner knowing, there's some sort of intuitions, some sort of connection that's there that is going to help you possibly avert a disaster. But on the other hand, it's like discernment was a big one. And I'm just going to kind of rant a little bit here. Like discernment, I found is it's like, uh, I don't drink wine, but I guess you would say it's like, um, to wine drinkers like if you're fine tuning your palate over time and being able to tell like what's a quote unquote good wine or bad wine something like that discernment seems to be like that too because there have been so many times where I was thoroughly convinced and you could swear up down left and right that you know what I was hearing or what I looked into was true and then only to have it crushed. See, like with the soul trap, it's another story because there's just too much. In my opinion, it's undeniable. It's right in front of our face, plain as day to see. But like so many stupid things I fell for and I would say, oh, I'm intuitively or I have my, you know, this inner knowing, this connection with, you know, some BS truth thing. And boy, like when, when I look back at some of the bullshit that like I used to connect with and, and think was true, it's embarrassing. It's really embarrassing. But I, I think again, and like, it's all part of the waking up process. It's all about getting us to realize who and what we are breaking through that programming that we've all been crushed with and in turn kind of opening ourselves up to a, a more expansive, I guess, consciousness or firm inner knowing about who and what we are as true essence being. So I don't know. That's kind of my soapbox moment for the, for the time being. Sorry. No one is going to tell me what to do. I need to give free choice to others and not manipulate them. They say I can ask questions if I have any. I can have everything I want. 
I am very creative. I should respect the free will of others. There is a balance between creating and manipulating. I should create with love and acceptance. Soon I will have answers about where to live and what to do. They are showing me I can, if I wish, move from Portugal to another country, a colder place somewhere in Europe. I will be fine. I will have a good job and I will have children. Interestingly enough, six months after this session, while I was transcribing the recording for this chapter, Sasha contacted me and gave me a wonderful update on her situation. Sasha and her husband Mark have reunited. She is packing to move back to Northern Europe. Sasha told me, I set Raoul free. I have accepted this lesson and have stopped trying to control things. And miraculous things are happening. I finally understand what they were telling me. I am learning to let go. Mark and I have reunited in more loving and supportive ways than ever before. I am moving back to Northern Europe. I have successfully started my own business, and I feel stronger now. I always thought that I had no free will, that somebody would give me instructions for life or tell me what to do. But I have the power to choose, and I now give others the freedom to choose too. I have chosen to let go. Clients seem to know the right time in their lives to schedule an LBL hypnosis session into the afterlife. Usually a fork in the road of life precipitates this action. It is important to note that when we are working on these deeper soul lessons, once the session is over, it can take weeks, even months, to fully process and understand everything that comes to us in an LBL session. There is clearly a transition time between receiving the information coming to an understanding of it, taking it into our soul, and integrating it into our life. Sasha's life is now moving in a positive direction, and she is focusing on her life purpose, to let go and enjoy life. All right. So that is case one. We're at about an hour and 20 minutes. I do have to take a break. These cases can get a bit, a bit lengthy, so hang in there. We'll be right back. And thank you for tuning in today. I appreciate you all. Hey, Conscious Soul, good to see you. All right, Identify Me, good to see you too. All right, I'll be right back, my friends. Amnesic Actor, good to see you too. <laughs> all right, I'll be right back, my friends. Thank you so much.
Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah. Appreciate you, my friend. Always good to see you. Okay, so headed back into segment two of part one of the Michael Newton cover to cover case review and commentary of Memories of the Afterlife. Just as a reminder, this channel is for educational purposes only, or perhaps entertainment purposes only, depending on what the law prefers. Uh, you can find the channel on Twitter, Instagram, Rumble, Odyssey, and Facebook. Feel free to check the About section of the channel as well as the each description tab on wherever you may be watching today. I also have a Truth in Gaming channel on YouTube and Rumble. And on there's uh, one more um, channel that I just opened on Rumble. Uh, it's uh, Laughing at Our Clown World Matrix, and that should be starting in the next week or so. So if you'd like to kind of just have a little different content where we laugh at the absurdity that is this realm, feel free to join me over there. And that'll likely be available on Odyssey as well. I still have to work out some configurations with Odyssey and see how that goes. But um, in the meantime, it's going to, at least for the time being, it's going to be a Rumble exclusive and likely open to Odyssey as well but not on youtube because i want to have some fun and some laughs and would love to see you all there so again that's um in the description tab and you can find that at laughing at our clown world matrix or i'm sorry our clown world laughing at our clown world <laughs> i'm gonna drop that in the in the strat in the chat for you right now feel free to join me over there and subscribe will likely be starting streams sometime in the next week or so so all right and um i got a lot for you guys too if you want we're gonna have some good laughs <laughs> you know i can't take this world seriously you just can't it's it, it it is a literal clown show it exposes itself more and more every day <laughs> and i think we're gonna have some fun so feel free to join me if that's your thing and um also want to give a big thank you to those who have supported the channel AAA, thank you for your kind super chat as well in by the break uh, appreciate you thank you so much and um i also have an email list for the channel you can find that in the description tab that's a good way for us to stay in touch and i promise not to spam you or bother you i will never ever ever sell your information so your email and personal details are safe with me and the last thing is is i do have memberships for the channel uh, available on odyssey and youtube where you can get some extra content each month and there's also a backlog of many videos we have a monthly members live stream the last sunday of every month and that should be about it your support is always appreciated but never expected um you know, YouTube is pretty bad with the percentage it takes. And, but, you know, there are some, if you are looking to make like a one-time donation or something to the channel, it's always appreciated. And you can find the links in the description tab for that. Okay. All right. Let's get rolling. Thanks again, everybody. And I'm um, just going to do a transition here really quickly so i can get the time stamps up okay and now we're going to go into the second case of the evening two head to heart by janelle marie pleasant hill california alchemy institute and newton institute healing arts and regression practitioner nde spiritual consultations this is a story of an executive and music therapist's struggle with personal issues that have affected his family relationships and also appear in different forms in his business environment. His primary issues are deep-seated feelings of aggression and being too headstrong, along with an underlying lifetime pattern of feeling rejected and devalued. 
As a result of his LBL experience, he has learned that leading from his spiritual heart center rather than from his analytical mind is a better way to live. He was able to release his strong, fixed mental pattern of what is right and what is wrong. He remembered the existence and the importance of the universal connection of all souls, which is musical in sound. And from his spirit guides, he received tools for working with his aggression and arrogance that, over time, helped to equalize his interactions with others. Mr. B., an executive whom I have known for several years prior to his Life Between Lives session, has struggled with personal issues that have affected his family relationships and that appear in different forms in his business environment. This highly respected executive, who is also an innovative music therapist specializing in autistic children, had deep-seated feelings of aggression that make it difficult for my wife and children to approach me and feel safe. Their ongoing concern is when will he blow up? In the initial discussion with Mr. B, I delve deeply to provide... Can, can we just say how working with autistic children, if you can't handle your family at home, I would say, you know, your profession shouldn't be working with autistic children. Just pointing it out. Just pointing it out. He posed during the session. Along with this outward expression of aggression, he indicates... I can't bear feeling insulted. Perfection must be maintained at all costs. He explains this by citing the following example. When I arrive home from work and see the dishes in the sink, I feel insulted, as if my wife and oldest son treat me like the dishwasher. The dishes are not done, therefore the house is not perfect. Mr. B sums it up when he tells me, if the external does not fit or meet with my level of expectation of perfection, I take it personally and drop into my lifetime pattern of feeling rejection, and therefore I feel devalued. During his session, there were three stops where Mr. B was provided key tools to integrate into his daily lifestyle. These are relevant to his current questions for this session and his unresolved pattern of aggression. The first place of importance occurred in Mr. B's past life, where he finds himself standing outside in front of a cave entrance, scolding, in a heartfelt manner, twenty or so people. The following excerpt is from this past life segment. Janelle Marie, what is your position in the village? Mr. B. I am a teacher, a guru, hermit, the guy people go to when they seek advice or need teaching. Janelle Marie. How are they receiving this information, this scolding, to do better? Mr. B. They are contrite and quiet. I am really very aware of my chest, sort of a spiritual heart I am carrying there. That is where I am coming from when I speak, the spiritual heart place, teaching from the heart. Janelle Marie. Is there more to describe about this spiritual heart place? Mr. B. I am powerful but it is okay because I have a balance between being powerful and not making anything out of it for myself. The spiritual heart is the place where the power and ego are balanced out. Here, Mr. B has connected with a forgotten part of himself. He is beginning to receive clarification and new awareness about teaching and leading from his spiritual heart, where he needs to begin to live within himself. Up to now, he was relating to others in an analytical manner, and he states, I was relating from my head, and I had a very strong fixed pattern of what was right and what was wrong. Further along in his session, Mr. B says, I am in my bubble with my soul group. One of Mr. B's important questions for his soul group is related to sacred contracts and is revealed in this next segment of Case Dialogue. Janelle Marie how are you feeling in this group? Mr. B. I'm really glad to see them again. And I have a special connection to a soul named R, because I know him well in this life, and so I am a little bit astonished. Janelle Marie. Can you tell me a little more about this? Mr. B. Well, it's because R is a very dear friend who is very important to me in my life right now and now I discover he is also a very important soulmate. As a soul, he is patient, consistent, steady, and very perceptive. Editor's Note I have found the public may have the misconception 
that all souls in a soul cluster group are primary soulmates. This is not true. Typically, we have just one member of a soul group who is an eternal, deeply bonded partner in our lives. However, they may not be with us in every life. The other members of the group are considered soul companions, and they often take supporting roles in our lives. If a soul from another group is working with us during a particular incarnation, they are called an affiliated soul. Janelle Marie One of your questions concerns sacred contracts. Let's explore the purpose of your contract with R. Mr. B. In my current life, his task is to set me back on track because I am on the verge of going from the jokester to getting focused on my spirit. With R, whether I see him in this life or in our soul group, whenever we talk, it is about his spirit or my spirit. There's nothing else we talk about. He's got this knack, both in the soul group and in this life now, where whatever happens, even if it is a typo in an email, he makes it into a spiritual thing. And he's always dead on. He's got this knack. And he is teaching me that talking about spirit doesn't have to be dry. It can be a lot of fun, and it can be funny, too. Editor's Note While I have mentioned different character types between souls in cluster groups before, this case gives us a different slant. Every soul group, especially in levels 1 and 2, has a range of immortal character traits that complement each other. Mr. B, the client in this case, states that he is the jokester in the soul group. R has the reputation of being steady and perceptive, while Gore is the courageous fighter. Presumably, others in the group are more quiet and thoughtful, or flamboyant risk-takers. However, notice that Mr. B in his current life has an aggressive, obsessive human mind that is quite different from a laid-back jokester. Here is an excellent example of a brain that is not temperamentally in conjunction, but rather in opposition to the character of the soul. Janelle Marie So his connection with you is tied to keeping you on track. Is this part of the sacred contract, as we talked about, very for your sacred. vocation and also for character building? Very, very sacred. Mr. B. Yes, he's showing me that. I have known R since we were 20, and I was floundering. He is reminding me that even at 20, I really wanted to study the psyche, the connection between spirit and psyche, and everything to do with that. R is saying I have this special gift with sound frequency. I have a spiritual capacity to understand sound and the meaning of sound, and he's telling me to use that in conjunction with healing. He is telling me I am on the right track with my assumptions of what are the right frequencies for healing, and I need to stop buying CDs looking for the right frequency. He is telling me I need to produce the sound myself. R is pointing out the frequencies I have been researching. Anything between first particle frequencies down to cell frequencies, down to the sounds of music. This track I have started establishing. I should continue developing and then publish. This publication has something to do with psychology. I'm not certain how right now, but I will be able to incorporate this study of sound frequencies into my field. Editor's Note Music is very relevant to this story, and music does play a significant part of what souls experience in the spirit world with vibrational resonating sounds that are manifestations of spiritual energy in terms of expression, communication, and healing. Janelle Marie, what is your feeling about what you have received? Mr. B., Having R in a soul group is one thing, but knowing he is a close soulmate in my physical life is a big, big help and gives me support. In the next segment of his soul group... So you can see how, you know, this is, again, the addiction to the sensory experience, to the soul group, to the, you know, uh, the soul partner, however you want to put it, right? And... It just is a good way to keep someone here. If you continually have this connection, this addiction, this um, this attachment to a specific individual or group of individuals within your soul group or 
uh, extended soul group that's right outside of that. And they kind of intermingle, and that's like a whole other thing. Newton kind of talked about it very briefly at the beginning here. But it's it's very easy to get lost in the sauce. And all we got to do is just say no. We are on an individual journey, my friends. Each and every one of us. We may be here as a group today, listening and talking to one another. But in all reality... When the rubber meets the road, uh, leading up to and at the time of natural death, you have to take the solo journey. Do your thing and never look back. And as a result, everyone else who you are close with or care about, they need to get themselves out whenever they're ready. And it just may not be their time. Now, I'm not talking about shun your entire family, leave her, you know, go scorched earth right here, right now. No, I'm not saying that. Sometimes I get comments like that, but that's not what I'm saying. Never have, never will. All right. All I'm saying is, is when you have an idea of your time coming, when it's time to go and there's a very, very, very high likelihood of you knowing that. You'll start to have dreams. You'll start to have lucid dreams. You may have out-of-body experiences. You may meet friends, family, uh, spiritual figures, depending on, you know, if you've allowed those things to, to continue to that moment when leading up to death. And they're going to, try and convince you now one thing you know i've talked about a lot is that i think it's to our benefit to have the early warning system i'm not cool with dealing with entities i don't want to deal with any of them i don't want any of this fake crap going around but when it comes to going into or approaching death then that's when you want the early warning system because what does that do? It tells you, okay, it's time for me to get serious. No more screwing around. I got to do what I got to do. And also I think it's a good idea to, to let your friends and family know. If, if you got a, a wife or a husband, uh, children, let them know how you feel now. It doesn't mean you have to obviously shut them off now. It's just so that they are prepared for when the time comes that you are going to take the solo path out of here and you don't want things like your loved ones being an attachment. You don't. I've told my girlfriend, I've told my family, you know, if, if I were to get some like terminal diagnosis or some like strong inner knowing, some sort of connection that I knew, you know, I didn't have much time left, you know, I'd wrap things up with them, tell them I love them, you know, I wish them luck, but so sad, time to go. You know, I'm going to take my solo journey. But until that time comes, there's no reason to even worry about that. All right. So please do not cut off your friends, your family, you know, live in the pits of hell until that time comes. You know, just do what you got to do. Live your life. And when that time does come, you start getting maybe premonitions and dreams and OBEs and visitations, deathbed visions, visitations, whatever the case may be, that's when you kind of got to lock things down. Because in my opinion, you know, that, that really is when it counts most. You don't just want interruptions and interference from the outside. You don't want to here well you know and, and having like that strong pull it's just something like i th i really feel needs to be separated but in, again until that time comes don't you know act nutty and crazy and just you know disconnect from everyone that's not the answer anyways yeah just do you and if my, in my opinion ask for the early warning system. You want it. You want the early warning system from the matrix. 
because it's going to provide you a, a little bit of a heads up. How long of a heads up, I don't know, but it's going to give you at least some sort of a heads up so you can plan accordingly and get yourself to a sovereign mindset, walk the individual path. You know, you're not going to have uh, some overwhelming connection with a nurse, nurse in a hospital or a nurse, you know, a hospice nurse or a doctor. You're just not. And if you do, then, well, I don't know what's going on there. But <laughs> anyways, you get my point. Whereas with family and friends and pets and all that, you're going to have that type of connection. And that's where I think you need to be very, very careful. That's all. Another soul named Gore. He is sort of the leader of the group, and I admire him. He is the fighter for the group and for our spiritual advancement. The conversation with Gore has an important focus and provides Mr. B with a key tool for becoming very present and shifting his aggression. The narrative picks up here. Mr. B. Gore is telling me, when I have feelings of rejection and do not feel valued, it is as if I'm looking into a mirror maze, like in a circus funhouse. I don't know whether I am looking at myself or at the people who devalue me. Oh, you're in a funhouse. It is a trap, and I am lost in there. Oh, it's a trap. I ask Gore, how do I get out? He says, by focusing away from those who devalue you. Focus either on my spirit, spirit guide, or the realm of heaven. <laughs> Focus on everything that isn't a sovereign or individual direction. Focus on the distractions. That's the translation. Seriously, listen to what they just said. It, it's so blatant. Don't focus on yourself. Focus on the distractions. Heaven, the spirit guides, you know, you know, blah, 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 blah. Focus on anything that isn't a sovereign intention. How do I get out? He says, by focusing away from those who devalue you. Focus either on my spirit, spirit guide, or the realm of heaven. I'm too distracted by the physical. He is reminding me to look inside, because outside, for sure, you won't get your satisfaction. Once I connect inside, then I am in the present. Janelle Marie, does he offer you a tool for doing this? Mr. B, first to touch my forehead, to bring my attention there. Also, Gore is encouraging me to pick up sword fighting again. I did that when I was young. Janelle Marie, does he mean literally or symbolically? Mr. B. Both. Literally, sword fighting aligns the physical with the spiritual. Symbolically, using the spiritual sword will keep me focused on what is relevant and essential, to stay simple and not load myself up with all kinds of distractions. And in particular, he is saying I need to drop appointments with all kinds of people who stir me up. Editor's Note Having been a fencer... I can say that while Mr. B appears to be acting out aggressive behavior with swordplay in the later scene with his young son, there is more going on here. Fencing is a highly focused physical expression of the mind, controlling rapid body movements, and it is a form of mental energy cleansing, as the story indicates. Historically, the sword has been called an instrument of spiritual self-purification. In Japan, for example, the blade is central to rituals of exorcism and thoughts of perfection. Janelle Marie, is there more to describe here? Mr. B, yes. The fear of being rejected is actually a great, great tool. He is pointing out that when I am in the mirror maze, I am with the wrong people and I am wasting my time. So this is actually a signal and a flag. It is a really cool spiritual tool, the fear of being rejected. Another specific and very real-world tool. Yeah, it's such a cool tool to be rejected. And, uh, I mean, really, ask yourself the question. If they didn't get the past life regression or the life between lives session, where would they be? They would be twiddling their thumbs, likely suffering, having issues lost, but yet 
what happens is is the lost goes into the further lost of instead of it being uh the matrix like or at least the herb sorry instead of it being the earth realm it's part of the astral realm matrix right so it's like one train of thought funnels into the other it's it, it's a backup program this is really what we're looking at we're looking at a backup program to further capture and keep individuals lost and not looking at things from a sovereign perspective again that's my opinion but uh, everything points towards that like the the biggest theme throughout earth and the astral realms is we're all one we're all connected and you know what maybe that's true i don't know but you know my gut tells me it's all about you know don't think for yourself don't do your own thing don't take initiative for anything except it when it involves the matrix it is a really cool spiritual tool the fear of being rejected another specific and very real world tool was offered to mr b for keeping his aggression under control during an important spirit world stop, he met with his council. The following is the session dialogue where the council interacts with Mr. B about his arrogance in his current life. Mr. B. I'm being told I shouldn't be so arrogant. I don't quite understand. Janelle Marie. Is there a tool for you about the arrogance? Perhaps a specific place in your body or an attitude they can describe to you so that you have a greater understanding? Mr. B. Ah, uh, yeah. I know it all. I always pull my energy up into my head because I feel I have to know it all. I think I can control my environment this way, but of course that's not possible. They are telling me that's arrogant, or that's the core definition of arrogance. Thinking this way keeps me in my head all of the time. I have to drop that. Janelle Marie. Is there a way they can guide you into dropping or moving out of arrogance? Mr. B. Yes, they have a very good way. They just suggested I clean the kitchen floor on my hands and knees. The energy <laughs> will circulate <laughs> through my body. <laughs> when I first heard this, I'm not even joking. I laughed for probably five, ten minutes. <laughs> What's the solution? <laughs> Loose yourself away and clean the kitchen floor. This is exactly what you'd expect from this crackpot matrix we live in. More labor. You must do more labor in order to clear yourself up and figure things out. <laughs> I mean, come on. See, this is how ridiculous this place is. This is what it has in its chamber as a solution for those who are spiritually lost. And it does a damn good job of it. It convinced her. It convinced her. We just it. It's just it's so bonkers. Here we go. They just suggested I clean the kitchen floor on my hands and knees. <laughs> the energy will circulate through my body instead of getting stuck in my head. All right, that brings the head down for sure. Janelle Marie, do they suggest how often? Mister B. Once a week, twice a week. They nailed me. I thought I would get out of this one. All day, they every day. They are really serious about this. I really have to do this. Janelle Marie. Anything more? Mr. B. This is so funny. Really funny. I am being directed to do kitchen work. Most of the time, I should be cleaning the kitchen. They are telling me to keep the kitchen spiffy clean. If it's spiffy clean, then I don't need to worry about my pretty little head. <laughs> they don't think it was as funny as I tried to make it out to be. Oh, and funny. I see my way of being funny about it was my way of trying to get out of it. But it's not possible. They are really serious about this one. Janelle Marie, is there more about this tool? Mr. B. Yes, I need to teach my son to do the same thing. How to Clean the Kitchen and the Bath Our session ended shortly after this dialogue. Mr. B had a lot to process. 
In the months that followed his LBL, Mr. B had the foresight to act on the tools offered in the soul group. Here, he describes the enriching effect sword fighting had on his relationship with his son, and how it assists him in shifting out of feelings of aggression and into being present. I engage in sword fighting with my ten-year-old son on our back porch. In using sword fighting tools with my son, he has learned to express his aggression without fear of me. We both now allow ourselves to express aggression in a relationship-building manner. Facing my aggression issue and integrating sword fighting in... Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's just integrate sword fighting into the, the father-son bonding relationship. I don't know. I mean... <laughs> I mean, it just... I mean, is the son okay? Is the father okay? I don't know. I wonder if we'll ever get a follow-up to that. <laughs> the son later died <laughs> 10 months later during a sword fight <laughs> where they were trying to improve upon their relationship. Our relationship, which is very important and dear to me. A second resultant effect is expressed in my work as an executive. In meetings, fellow executives express a rather high amount of aggression, of which I am often on the receiving end. In sword fighting, I learn to split the oncoming energy in half with the sword. The aggression coming at me is split in half and passes me by. Often in these meetings, I visualize a sword and am reminded of this concept. Since initiating this practice regularly, other executives have commented that I am so much calmer in meetings. I also learned by touching my forehead, I can split my own aggression. This touching takes me inside, and it directs my energy to feel present. As a result of following the council's serious advice, Mr. B tells me later, I became aware I wanted some specialized therapeutic support for the aggression and feelings of rejection. Along with this, I followed the council's suggestion to scrub the kitchen floor every week oh. and found I learned to be humble, a quality oh that cannot be taught, God. only acquired. A, qu a quality that can't be taught. Oh, it's, it's taught here. It, it's absolutely taught. With every brush stroke of the floor, I turn into a Zen moment, and all of a sudden, I love being incarnated on Earth. Thank you, guides. Thank you, Matrix. By doing this weekly, I realized I had been given a sacred tool for keeping my aggression in control. <laughs> it's a After tool. one year of scrubbing the floor, Mrs. B said to me, I'm impressed. You are keeping your anger in control. One year later, Mr. B says there have been real-life benefits in maintaining monthly contact with R as a way of honoring this sacred contract he discovered in his soul group. Wax he on, describes it in the following off. manner. After several monthly conversations, I realized R had a contract with me in this life to make fun of me. By doing this, he shifts me out of my perfectionist attitude and my feelings of rejection and devaluation. I had the enlightening realization that he is the only one I would allow to make fun of my attitude— and this is an important aspect of our sacred contract. <laughs> also, we both came to the awareness that all of us, as souls living on the physical plane now, are connected universally. There is a frequency to this connection, and it is musical in sound. R, in his typical form, challenged me to research this frequency, teach it, and publish it in Europe due to their long-standing acceptance of anthroposophy. Mr. B now uses this frequency data with autistic children and their parents. He has found this sound frequency activates neuroprocessing language and enables some of the children to say basic sentences when they were previously unable to do so. Also, he has taught adults about the use of these sounds for various physical illnesses, such as multiple sclerosis, fibromyalgia, and sleep apnea. Mr. B says this special knowledge of harmonics helps to keep him humble. He now invokes existing harmonic patterns, and this allows him to truly teach and support his clients in their life goals. He no longer feels he has to pretend to be a powerful healer. As an executive and department head, there were shifts in organizational dynamics realized by Mr. B. He has successfully integrated and utilized a roundtable format presented in his soul group as the model for his departmental organization chart and team meetings. The result of duplicating this conversation model caused equalization in his department position with that of his employees, thereby providing a safe environment for them to speak freely and to state opinions without fear of consequence. In staff meetings, he simply raises an issue and listens to staff input until a natural consensus emerges. By duplicating this productive and soothing dynamic, managers no longer see him as a threat and someone to obey. More projects are delivered on time and on budget, and there is a genuine upbeat feeling in his office environment. 
We see in this discussion of Mr. B's session that the in-depth, basic, precious information he received when taken to heart and acted upon has an appreciable impact in his day-to-day -day lifestyle. The data also points toward a positive domino effect on the lives of those connected to him both personally and in business. Mr. B's final comment sums up the bottom line effect of his soul journey. Living from my heart versus my head has enriched my life. It has put me on a journey to equalize my interactions with people. I've stopped viewing myself as more important than others. As a facilitator for Life Between Lives spiritual regression, I never know where a particular client's soul journey will lead us, where the client will end up in life, or how the presenting issues and questions will be resolved. However, what is consistent are similar reports of unique and noteworthy scenarios reflecting the positive, insightful, empowering, and fascinating data received in their respective soul journeys. It appears there is an ability to use and integrate similar lifestyle tools easily and effectively as a result of a deepened connection to the client's personal soul life. I find the spiritual realm to be friendly, joyful, faithful, and beneficent toward those who are willing to embark on and embrace this deep, profound soul journey inward. All right. So, <laughs> it's just, I mean, it's incredible, right? I mean, it just happens over and over and over again. No end in sight. <laughs> I mean, seriously, anyone who, like, is questioning the whole luge thing, I mean, really, it's, it, it shows itself consistently to us. If it's not this, it's something else. It goes on and on and on. We can all see it. And I think it's, it's a very, very, very accurate depiction about what's going on in this realm. And I also, you know, I kind of like to add that I think it's it's not just loosh, but just our creative energy in general. That's what it does. And it's it really it's incredible. So anyways, um there is a lot more to come. But I think I'm gonna probably wrap things up for today. We're at about two, yeah, about two and a half hours. So uh, feel free to keep an eye on the um, on the on the channel, the community tab, the social media stuff like that. Uh, I want to welcome Chris to the Last Timers Club. I appreciate you, my friend. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna be headed over to the Truth and Gaming channel. I'm gonna head on and do some more Witcher 3. I also have a, a new game that'll be popping up sometime soon as well. So if you want to join me over there, as soon as I close things out, uh, a link will pop up to the Truth and Gaming channel. And if you could please hit the like button here. And if you're new, subscribe if you found this content helpful. I'd greatly appreciate it. And, you know, even commenting in the live chat or afterwards in the... Um, and the comment section helps a lot. It helps spread the word a little bit about the channel. And uh, I appreciate each and every one of you. So uh, I'll see some of you over on the gaming channel. Just give me about maybe five, ten minutes tops to, to get it up and running. And I'll probably, it won't be much of a countdown clock. But I'm just going to need a few minutes to tweak some settings on my end. And then we'll be good to go. So uh, much more to come with this series. We'll be going into part two probably on Tuesday afternoon. I'm really going to make an effort to help uh, those who are in different time zones be able to join the live streams. I know I do a lot of late night streams often in the U.S., so they're, they're not really good for many other time zones, but especially Europe. So, all right. Uh, hope to see some of you soon. And thanks again to everyone who uh, sent some super chats or donations and joined the Last Timers Club. I appreciate each and every one of you. Take care of yourselves. Don't work too hard. And we'll see each other probably Tuesday afternoon. Uh, thinking maybe 
3 or 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and there'll likely be another one on Thursday and then probably Sunday. But uh, I'll, I'll have a, a, a rough schedule and an outline for the future of this series uh, within the next few days. So thanks so much. Appreciate you all, and see you soon. Thanks so much.